The thought that I have for us today is one that I've talked about individually. I know Larry, you and I have talked about this recently. I know Jerry and I have talked about this. Billy, if he's here this morning, there's been a few conversations where this has popped up. And I had in the back of my mind that at some point I'd like to talk about it together. And uh, this morning is that morning. I woke up feeling this is the conversation, this is the thought for the day. And it all revolves around how we define success. What are your measurements for success as a person, as a Christian, in your job, in your marriage? It's really important. So let's use the football game later on today as an example. What is success for the game later today? What do you think? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. What do we got? Preparation. Preparation. So success is preparation. What else is success? Winning. Winning. Right? Will they be successful if they lose? No. Not really. Why? Because they tried that 100% and it didn't come through. <laughs> yeah. How is the game measured? It still would be successful if there was no injuries. No injuries could be a way to be successful. How is the game measured, though? How are winners and losers measured? In points. They're measured in points. You can try really hard and still lose. You didn't win. You didn't succeed. And this is the key to so many things in life that if I could just know this more myself and if I could communicate this well this morning, what you are measuring in your life is critical. What you're measuring in your life is critical because the things you're measuring yourself by are whether you're going to feel like you're doing a good job or a bad job, whether you feel like you're winning or losing, whether you feel successful in life or not. So what are some ways that you get measured at work? How does your boss measure your success? Performance. Performance. Hitting key goals, being effective at what you do. What if you're like a really nice person but do a bad job at work? Does your boss love you? No. Are you successful? No. They're not measuring niceness. You didn't get hired for being the nicest person with a lack of skill. You're measured on your skills. How about in marriage? What makes for a successful marriage? What gets measured? Love. Time. Time, love, sacrifice. sacrifice. What gets measured? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Yeah. How about in faith? What gets measured? How do you know if you're being successful in your faith? It's a little bit trickier. There's some answers, though. Your prayers get answered. Okay. Yep. Yep. Commitment. Abiding. Commitment, abiding. Peace. Peace. Wisdom. Wisdom. Strength. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Change. Change. Yeah. In and all of this, there's a little bit of. Um, a trick to it. It's very American and maybe worldwide, maybe human, I can't speak for more than that, but I can speak from my experience, that we measure ourselves by our results. We measure by results. And I would say that that's the wrong measurement for most things in life. Because sometimes we try really, really hard and it turns out badly. Out of our control, badly. So did we fail or did we succeed? If we gave our best and the results were out of our hand, is it success or failure? Depends on what you're measuring. And what if you're working really hard for that future thing, that future retirement, that future vacation, that weekend, you're working really, really hard because that's the goal, the results are the goal. And then you get to retirement age and your health is kaput. And you don't get to enjoy the traveling that you wanted and the, the peace and the relaxation and the golfing that you were looking forward to. Is it worth it? Is it not? Do you measure it by the results? What happens if what we're shooting for never happens? There's a lot of people, including Jesus himself, the results were like the worst possible results. He got killed for doing all the right things. Now he showed that couldn't stop him. So his results superseded what the world gave him, but sometimes it feels like that for us too, I think. We're giving our best and then it just ends up badly, no matter how hard we tried. 
That's only failure, though, if we were judging ourselves by the results. There's a phrase in the Bible, it's in the book of Romans, happens a couple of times, it talks about the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. That Paul is trying to work towards this way that we live in obedience. And that gets kind of a bad rap. As if obedience is, here's the laws, here's the rules, make sure you follow the rules, so obey. But actually, think of it more like calling your dog to you. Come. Obeying is actually all about listening. When you obey something, you feel led, you feel called, you know what you're supposed to do, and so as you respond to that, you are conceding, you are, what's the right word, you are uh, responding, you're listening, you're obeying. I think measure, Christians should measure themselves by their obedience and not their results. I was on a mission trip once to um, Minnesota, and there was a missionary family that had served at the Chippewa Indian tribe up in Red Lake Reservation. And I was there on my own first as a team leader to visit and meet them. Then went back with a group of teenagers, and we were there for a week serving. This wonderful, lovely couple that loves Jesus so much and dedicated their life to telling others about him found themselves in an Indian reservation where there was such hostility towards Christianity that they made no progress for like decades of being there. They would have church on Sunday and maybe one or two of the uh, Native Americans in that community would come in because they knew if they came in their family would cut them off. And if you live on a reservation that is your world, if you're cut off inside that then you're cut off from cut off. And so it was so hard for them to show love and have anybody respond. And I just remember them saying, we're not here for the numbers. We're here because God sent us here. And even if no one comes to Christ, if no one believes what we're sharing, that's okay. We're here because we know we're supposed to be here. And I just thought, man, could you stick it out? Could I stick it out for 10 years with no results? Probably not. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I would. They did. And they were like heavy hearted about it but they weren't discouraged. They weren't quitting, they weren't coming home. They were meant to be there. Obedience. They were successful in their own eyes because they were just serving where God put them to serve. They viewed it as success because what they were measuring was not the results. There's many different stories I could bring in. Let me bring another one just from this past week. Some people came in to use our, our facilities and we love having it used for all sorts of different things. And this particular group was from a church up in Holbrook. And they said, wow, it's looking great. Things are coming along. And I was kind of telling our story about how we got here. And they said, so what are you going to do when you outgrow it? And I was like, well, I don't know if we're going to outgrow it. It'd be kind of nice if we didn't. If we were still small enough that we could all know each other and that family, like there's value in the, the smallness. Small things are beautiful. But that's not an American value. Bigger is better here. Results. And so because you're shooting for results, the ends justify the means. If I can show you that this thing works, then these are the practices you should put into play in your business and whatever. It doesn't matter if they're ethical, it doesn't matter if they're helpful, it doesn't matter if they're good, they work. What works? What's the word you've been reading? Utilitarian? Uh, utility. Much in the Christian faith has become about utility. How can I get the results I'm looking for? But what if obedience is success? What if being where you're supposed to be is success? What does success look like in the middle of divorce? Is there any such thing as success? Divorce itself feels like the definition of a failure of a time, a failure of a partnership. But what if we're not in charge of the results? Then can't we be in a failing thing but experiencing God's peace? That, that we are obeying how he's calling us to respond in those moments? success in the midst of failure. What we're measuring matters all so, so, so much. I, I've heard this phrase and I, I'm going to say it, it's obnoxious to me. But pastors measure success by butts and bucks. How many butts are in the seat and how many bucks are in the plate? Like how obnoxious is that? But how easy can it be? Because what else can you measure? If you ask me right now to measure the spiritual health and condition of each of you, how could I ever? 
How could I even measure it in myself to know truly where my heart's at and what God's doing in me? And how far along am I? What does that even mean? I just know that today he wants me here. And there's things that he's calling me to do, so we're trying to move forward in those things. I see him at work. So that's success. But it may never be measured in money. And it may be never measured in numbers. It may be never measured in a completed building. It may be never measured in concrete things because the results are in God's hands. And if we look at Jesus, much of his life was not successful. He got ran out of town after town after town when all he was there to do was heal people and tell them God loves you. It's not as he, Jesus did not live a successful life. He had like a successful ending. He did not live a successful life by like any measurable scale. And yet we're told to be like him. And so we say, well, I know I'm doing well because I'm getting good results. Well, what happens when God takes away the joy that you experience while you pray? Will you keep praying if it just feels dry? Isn't that success? To want to be with God even when he doesn't give you happy feelings about it? Or when you're tired or when you're sick? And what happens if you pray and pray, pray really hard? I heard another story this past week of someone who gathered in the last church they were a part of, now they're a part of our church. They gathered a whole bunch of people together because they were praying for this person to be healed. This person had cancer. And they felt in their heart just so sure that if they just got the people together in the church and prayed, this person would be healed. And so talk to people, okay, okay, people heard it, felt it. And the entire time this person had strength of conviction, true faith. We're going to pray for this person and the cancer is going to go away. Because God does miracles and he absolutely can do that. And they got together and they prayed for the person. They felt the Holy Spirit in that room. It was all of God, truly. And the person did not get better and the person passed away. So were those prayers successful or failures? Depends on how you measure it. Are you measuring miracles? Are you measuring faithfulness? Are you measuring obedience? Or are you measuring conversions? It's hard to even know what to measure. So this is a tricky thing. There's no clear-cut answer. I want us to see fruit in our lives. I want to see people turning to Jesus and being baptized here and being saved and committing their lives and celebrating communion and, and serving those. That's all good. But you know what, if we start measuring those things as the proof of our success, we could leave God behind and be very successful. We could leave the Holy Spirit all out of that. Look at all the people that got converted. Think of all the Billy Graham crusades all across our country. All those people that came forward and professed faith. I think God was working in every single one of those and I respect his ministry so much. But now why isn't our whole country Christian? What happened to all those people? that had a moment. If we just measure it by professions of faith, we're fine. But if we look at the world, we're like not fine. So how do you even measure it? In your marriage, how, how do you measure it? Well, is it obedience? I think the listening part of obedience could be a great measurement in marriage. Do you hear what your other person is saying? the person is, would you hear them? Because when they say, I, I need this, or I want this, or I'd love this, or I, I love you for this, or thank you for that, or this is hard, or I don't like that, or what about this, or could we? All those things are opportunities for listening and obeying, but not in a law way, in a love way. Oh, this is something we could do together. The success is in the listening, the success is in following, not in the results. So how do, you, how do you measure your, your success? What are your metrics for success? Oh, she's fine. It's in faithfulness. And it gets even a little bit trickier because the things and the ways that we're faithful can become the things that we make the point. So if I were to ask us, what would you be obedient for in your faith? You might say prayer. But just because you pray every day doesn't mean that you're close to the Lord. Just because you say, I gotta go do my 15 minutes of prayer doesn't mean that you have a close relationship with him or you're listening to him. So number of hours prayed, 
You know, this is a difference in prayer between Christianity and other religions. We talk about Ramadan and praying all these times a day. The Bible says clearly we will not be heard because of many words. You can pray once for something and you can be fine for it forever. Or you can pray for something faithfully every day. It's not the quantity. So how are you successful in your prayer life? If you pray every day or if you pray the right way, the right amount, about the right things? The Bible says that we're supposed to come to Jesus. He says, come to me. All you are weak and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. These are things he calls us to do, his yoke, his instructions. And I will give you rest for your souls. So it's a taking in of Jesus instead of a pleasing and appeasing Jesus. We receive him, we accept him, we want to be with him. And because of that, that is our success. It's too easy to just go to church on Sunday mornings and say, I've done the thing. It's too easy to say, I prayed today. It's too easy to look back and say, oh, I haven't read my Bible enough. I'm not doing enough for the Lord. Oh, I haven't served enough. Those are all secondary things. The primary thing and the only thing that matters is that we want to be with Jesus more than we want anything else. And that is success. That is success, to want to be with Him more than we want to even serve Him, more than we even want to get answers from Him, more than we want to get what we're looking for is just to be with Him and to serve Him. Mary and Martha, right? One's running around with lots of business and he looks at Mary and says, she's chose, chosen what's better. She's chosen to be with me. When you pray, are you praying for results or are you just talking with Jesus? Are you disappointed or disillusioned because God hasn't yet given you what you want? Well, then you're saying you want him for what he can give you. And what kind of relationship is that? So it's easy to measure results when it comes to sports. There's easy points in that. This all of a sudden gets very vague and very unclear. But what I would like to suggest, and I'll read for you, I think maybe... My Bible's probably in the back. I'll just use my phone for it. Um, I'd like to read to you the description of success that Jesus gives us, and it's in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have a phone or if you have your Bible, want to turn with me, Matthew 5. Jesus teaches... Um, these beatitudes as a means of measuring, a means of identifying, of quantifying what can't be seen. Sometimes we see someone that looks like the most holy and, and religious person we've ever met, really disciplined in their faith. We look up to them because they're like rigorous and they do a great job of like holding themselves away from the world and they do a great job of, of prayer and they're, they're, they're just so intentional. And then years down the road, they're walking away from their faith, or their marriage is crumbling, or they're not sure they believe. Well, well, what did all that good intention and hard, rigorous discipline get them? It doesn't guarantee results. And therefore, it's the process. It's how we live towards our end that matters. So when Jesus defines what he thinks the measurables are, what he thinks the metrics are for success, he doesn't talk about results. In fact, the thing I love the most about the Beatitudes is there's no instructions that come with any of them. He tells you you'll be blessed in this way if you're this sort of person, and then gives you no help to know how to get there. Because it's not an instruction manual. It's a way to look at yourself and say, who am I with you, God? Because God's not a God of results. He's in charge of the results. He's a God of relationship. That's what he wants with us. If he needed our help with creation, he would have called us when it was time to make the universe. If he needed our help with the redemption plan, he would have asked our advice on how to set up this whole Messiah, crucifixion, resurrection thing. He wants us to enjoy being with him in the process, in his plan. He's taking care of things. Who we are in the meantime is 
followers, listeners, obeyers, and people that reflect his character to the world. So I would just like to read them today. This is the scripture that we're focusing on. I always want to read from the Bible, from scripture. It's not my thoughts or your thoughts that are going to save us in any way. So this is our chance to listen to Jesus himself and hear how he measures success. In Matthew 5, verse 2, it says, Jesus opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is this wonderful word. I like that it's hard to define. It means three or four different things all simultaneously. Blessed means like you'll be blessed. It's like a reward thing, a good thing. You'll be blessed. Uh, it also means happy. Like you will find internal joy in this way. It also means favored. God will show you favor. You will experience God's favor as you live in this way. Tell me if it sounds very American <laughs> to be poor in spirit, to be humbled, to be lowly. No, we want to rise. How are we getting ahead in our career? How are we viewed by the people around us? How does our house look compared to the house next to us on the block or our car next to the one next to us in the parking lot? It's all about presentation and affluence and achievement. But what if those are all missing the mark? What if those aren't the thing? What if we got everything we wanted? Would it bring us favor from God, happiness, or that we would be blessed? No. No, the house that we have is not going to bring us God's favor or our happiness. And in fact, it's blessed to be lowly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those are the ones who really inherit the good thing. Not the people on the ego trip, but the people who are humble in spirit. Because then God rises up, and God is God, and God wins for them. That is why they receive and achieve, because he does it. Okay, so that's one way we're blessed. That's a metric for success. We should be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, how humble am I being? And I wish that I wasn't humble right now. I wish that I wasn't being so humble. I wish I wasn't so lowly. I, I can't wait till I get to that next level of achievement or that thing or that, that surgery or that career advancement or that degree. Or like we're waiting to get out of our humble state. But what if we're blessed while we're in our humble state? What if our obedience is our success? How about the next one? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Cry your tears. Mourn for others. Grieve things when they break down in your life. Those are the emotions that God has given us. They're the ones that reflect his love, his grief, his tears, his joy. Be like God and feel your feelings. Don't be too manly to cry. Don't toughen up. Don't ignore what you feel. Don't put down those around you who are feeling their feelings. It honors God to weep the tears that are meant to weep. With no tears, we have no compassion. With no compassion, we don't care about the people around us. Without caring about the people around us, we walk all over them and feel nothing. Jesus is the exact opposite. He cared deeply and cried for those who were in need around him. It's not an American value, but Jesus is this upside-down kingdom. His values are often the opposite of what we value. It is success to mourn. How about blessed are the meek? This means people who have like controlled strength. It doesn't mean passive. It doesn't mean weak. I'd love to talk about this more with any of you at any time. This is a deep word. I love this word. It's one of my favorite in the whole Bible. Um, and the Greek word here just means like you're ready for anything. And when it's time to just sit back and wait and let things happen, you do. And when it's time to step forward, you do. It's restrained strength. Blessed are those who are meek, those who aren't aggressive or power hungry or steamrolling everyone or so passive and weak that they're doormats and they're not experiencing their own self-worth. Blessed are you when you are in that proper place in relationship to others and your own strength. How about the next one, verse 6? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You will find God's favor in those times where you're hungry to experience Him. 
If you're busy, if you're just having no appetite for reading your Bible or prayer or anything having to do with faith, if it's just not speaking to you, then what will you miss? You'll miss the satisfaction. You'll miss the results because they're not in your control. What's in our control is our process, our approach, our hunger, and our thirst for God's righteousness. God takes care of the results. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This is success, to show mercy on people that need it and love people who are in need. Be compassionate. God promises then He will pour mercy on us when we need it. The last three. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It's very possible to be very successful in the world, but not be pure in heart. To have gotten there by, by hook and by crook and stepping on every person to get where you want to go. But then what would you miss? What's the result that God gives? You're not going to see God. You're not going to see. It's those that are focused on Him that end up getting that encounter with Him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We talked about peace as a version of success. But how about if you bring peace? Where are the needs? Where are the people? Where are the places that are broken? Can you bring peace to those places? Or what if you spend your whole life like my missionary friends, bringing peace, but no one wants to receive it? Is it success? Look what the promise is for that one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. You'll carry the name of God because He offers peace to everyone through Jesus, and so many people do not accept. So is God a failure? If you judge God by the results of how many people end up with Him in eternity and how many don't, you say, wow, God's stats aren't looking so good. We're called sons of God because we offer peace. And that's what Jesus offers for people that are broken. He offers healing. For people that are lost, he offers a home. Blessed are the peacemakers, the workers of peace. That's the best translation of that, peace workers. And lastly, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you are blessed, you are happy, and you will experience God's favor when people are out to get you. It's counterintuitive. Not when you have victory over all your enemies, not when you prove them all wrong, not when you get past this, but in the midst of it, you experience God's favor because God's in charge of the results. And what he asks us for is obedience in faith. And how can we know what it looks like to obey unless we hear him say to us, this is what I want you to be. This is what I want you to do. That's why Jesus is so important because he paints a picture for us and we look at that life. Our lives should look exactly like Jesus's. That's the goal. What did he do? How did he talk? How did he live? We're supposed to be that. Him living in us, making us into that. And if he wasn't measured by success, then why are we both frustrated by a lack of results and also not caring enough about who we are in the process? In the football game today, they're not going to be like, well, you know, we're all winners in our own way, so everybody gets a Super Bowl trophy. <laughs> a participation <laughs> Super Bowl trophy, yeah. You're not going to get that. And we as Christians sometimes encounter extreme levels of failure and disappointment. But we can have our kind of head held high in those moments of failure if we feel like, Father, I'm trying to live for you in the midst of this tragedy. I'm trying to appreciate you and have a thankful and grateful spirit even in the midst of fallout. And if I can walk through this failure trusting you and, and trying to bring your love into it, then it's actually success. 
this place, the, our church and this location of the center, I, I don't want us to measure our success by how big we get, how many programs we can have, how well a coffee shop does, because we could have all those things and not have Jesus. Or we could do our very best for Jesus and it could all fall apart or just be a very small version of something. But which one is God going to honor us for? Which one is he going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, when we see him face to face? It's going to be that we lived for him and left the results up to him. We can love Jesus today. We can come into his presence today. We are. We sing. We pray. We're about to take communion. We're experiencing it. This is enough. This is enough. You don't need to be driven to prove yourself to anybody. Because guess what? You probably won't prove yourself to anybody. You'll end up disappointing everybody. But if we entrust ourselves to God, then the results, come what may, good or bad, will be something that He's using for our good and for His glory. He works all things together for those that are called according to His purpose. Sometimes when we get what we pray for, it's the worst thing that can happen to us. Can't wait to get that promotion. You get the promotion, but it comes with like 40 more hours a week so you don't see your family ever again. Congrats! There goes your marriage. Congrats. There goes your relationship with your kids. Congrats. There goes your time off and your Sabbath and your rest and your peace. Congrats on the new job. Dear God, give me this relationship. I really want to be in a relationship with this person. And then you get into a relationship with that person and it's the worst thing. They weren't the right person. It wasn't the right time. It's just what we wanted. And then we get it. We're like, ah, oh, I got what I wanted. Mm, look what happened. Don't measure yourself by your results. This is grace. If only good people got to heaven, then I'd say work really hard for your results. But good people don't get to heaven. Forgiven people get to heaven. That's Andy Stanley's line. I'll steal it from him with pride. It's a great line. Good people don't get to heaven. Forgiven people get to heaven. So we have our successes. We have our failures. We don't measure ourselves by those. God is not measuring us by results. We're all pretty poor at what we do. Awesome. He picked fishermen. He picked tax collectors. He picked the least of these. He picked the Jewish people to be his emissaries. In that era, he should have picked the Egyptian people. They were the nation, or the nation of the world. Or he should have picked the Greek empire. The Rome. Why didn't he? He picked the smallest to say that he can do great things when we trust him. And even if we're small, he is great. And so on this day where we talk about results and in our country where we love those who are bigger and better and faster, and we appreciate those who have achieved success in their fields and they can prove it because they have the houses and they have the money and they have the fame and they have these things to show for it. I'm like, well, if that's what you're measuring, you can go for those things. But what if you get them? What if you just got them all? Where does it leave you? And what did it cost you? Jesus says, um, how does he say, can you remind me if you forfeit the whole world? What does a man gain if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? That's how Jesus put it. And so I would love to invite everyone here to reevaluate what your measurements for success are. Because you, you might not be fair to yourself. You might be expecting too much. Or you might also just be targeting the wrong things. I hope that you will succeed. And I want to pray for you to succeed and be successful in your family. But what does that look like? How could you measure it? Who would you be to them? What can you do for them? What does success look like in your faith in our church? Well, it's going to take good listening to find specific answers because in order to obey God, we need to know what he's saying first. So I invite you to start by just asking God, okay, tell me what it would look like instead of us telling God what it would look like. But I guarantee you it's not going to look like what the world thinks. It's going to be very different. And in that difference is the peace. Because you don't have to compete. And you're not measured by your results. You're not even measured by our fruit. We're known by our fruit. That kind of shows who we are. But you don't have to have more fruit or less fruit. We don't compare ourselves in that way. We're just glad to be with Jesus. And he's making good things happen. 
And if one good, things ha good thing happens in our lifetime, beautiful. And if a million good things happen in our lifetime, beautiful. There's so much to be grateful for. And the minute we set our metrics on our results, it steals our gratitude. Makes us constantly discontent with what we have, wishing we had something more. Makes us think if we just work harder, we'll get better results. And it takes the grace all out of it. So please, don't measure yourself in the way the world measures yourself. Um, the way God keeps score is much different. <laughs> he keeps score by love and by faithfulness, by obedience to him. So the only thing that matters is for you and him to talk and say, okay, what's obedience look like in this moment? The only true success is obedience to the Lord. And then he will take care of the results in his way. And it will be better than anything that we set up for ourselves as our own target that we were shooting for in the first place. So I'd like to take a minute and just quietly ask the Lord what it looks like to be successful. What does it look like to obey in your season of life right now? Let him tell you. Ask the Holy Spirit. Just take a moment, bow your heads, quietly think. And then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper together in just a moment. Father God, we humble ourselves in, in your presence right now. We know that you are in this place with us and you're desiring to speak to us. Please give us freedom from the world's expectations, freedom from needing to please other people or compete with them, freedom from being judgmental of ourselves, either judging ourselves doing great or judging ourselves as failures. Let us simply evaluate whether we are clinging to you. You will be the judge of all. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give a word and a thought to each one of us as to what it can look like to obey you in this season of our lives. For those in this room that that means stopping certain things, obedience in that way, I pray for courage. I pray for strength. I pray for an eagerness to rise up in them to get past things and be beyond them and put them behind them. And for those in this room that, that listening means to begin things, I pray that you would help them to stay focused on you and on that word and to make it a priority and to not be distracted by money and busyness and clutter in our lives, but to shoot for what's most important, whatever that may be. Pray for clarity for those. And Father, for each of us, I ask that you would give us a sense of peace. I pray that you would give us a sense of freedom. Thank you that if even others judge us poorly, we don't, re we don't answer to them. They're not the judge you are. So thank you for setting us free from others' expectations and from the measurables that are convincingly put onto us. Help us to see through all that. Help us to be poor and humble in spirit. Help us to be mourners and compassionate ones. Help us to be people who love others that are different than us because your grace is offered to all and it's the wonderful equalizer of every race and every gender and every age and every background and every skill and strength and weakness. Jesus, you invite us all the same. 
So we thank you for that. Pray that you would give us a, a release from the things that are, are binding us and in so doing free us to just love you and serve you and obey you with whole hearts. We thank you that you will do this in us, that you're calling us to it, and that you will provide a way. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.